Spirituality is a particular term which actually means a dealing with intuition. In the theistic tradition, there is a notion of clinging into a word. A certain act is regarded as uh, displeasing to a divine principles. A certain act is regarded as pleasing for the divine whatever. In the tradition of non-theism, however, it is very direct that the case history are not particularly important. What is actually important is here and now. Here and now. Now is definitely now. We try to experience what is available there on the spot. There's no point in thinking that the past did exist that we could have now. This is now, this very moment. This very moment. Nothing mystical, just now, very simple, straightforward. And from that nowness, however, arises a sense of intelligence, always, that you are constantly interacting with the reality one by one, spot by spot, constantly. We actually experience fantastic precision, always. But we are threatened by the now, so we jump to the past or the future. Paying attention to the materials that exist in our life, all these choices take place all the time, but none of them are regarded as bad or good per se. Everything we experience are unconditional experience. They don't come along with the label by saying this is regarded as bad, or this is good. But we experience them, but we don't actually pay heed to them properly. We don't actually regard that as a, that we are going somewhere. We regard that as a hassle, waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. That's the problem. And that is not trusting the nowness properly, that what is actual experience now possessed a lot of powerful things. It is so powerful that we can't face it. Therefore, we have to borrow from the past, invite future all the time. And maybe that's why we seek religion. Religion. Maybe that's why we march in, the street. march in the street. Maybe that's why we complain to the society. To the society. Maybe that's why we vote for the presidents. It's quite ironical. Very funny indeed.
more you begin to investigate what we think we understand, where we came from, what we think we're doing, the more you begin to see we've been lied to. We've been lied to by every institution. What makes you think for one minute that the religious institution is the only one that's never been touched? The religious institutions of this world are at the bottom of the dirt. The religious institutions in this world are put there by the same people who gave you your government, your corrupt education, who set up your international banking cartels. We have been misled away from the true and divine presence in the universe that men have called God. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. And unless and until you are prepared to look at the whole truth, and wherever it may go, whoever it may lead to, the more you educate yourself, the more you understand where things come from, the more obvious things become, and you begin to see lies everywhere. You have to know the truth and seek the truth, and the truth will set you free. Tell you the truth, folks. I gotta tell you the truth. When it comes to bullshit, big time major league bullshit, you have to stand in awe of the all-time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims, religion. Think about it. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day and the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do and if you do any of these 10 things he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time but he loves you. <laughs> in billions of dollars, they pay no taxes, and they always need a little more. Now, you talk about a good bullshit story. Holy shit. is the sun. As far back as 10,000 BC, history is abundant with carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun would rise, bringing vision, warmth and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness of night. Without it, the cultures understood, the crops would not grow and life on the planet would not survive. 
These realities made the sun the most adored object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn catalogued celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of a year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or god, God's sun, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the 12 constellations represented places of travel for God's sun and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun anthropomorphized and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy known as Set. And Set was the personification of the darkness or night. And metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis, Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher. And at the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected. Krishna of India, born of the Virgin Devaki, with a star in the east signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and upon his death was resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten Son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others. And upon his death, he was resurrected. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th, he had 12 disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the Truth, the Light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. The fact of the matter is, there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world which subscribe to these general characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? Why the virgin birth on December 25th? Why dead for three days in the inevitable resurrection? Why 12 disciples or followers? To find out, let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. 
Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adorn the new savior. He was a child teacher at 12, and at the age of 30 he was baptized by John the Baptist, and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples which he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick, walking on water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which on December 24th aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why the Three Kings follow the star in the east, in order to locate the sunrise the birth of the sun. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. Virgo was also referred to as the house of bread, and the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to House of Bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on Earth. There is another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolized the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. For the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share the crucifixion, three-day death and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring and thus salvation. However, they did not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter, this is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night, and the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the 12 disciples. They are simply the 12 constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the sun, travels about with. In fact, the number 12 is replete throughout the Bible. Coming back to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol, the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the zodiac. This is why Jesus in early occult art is always shown with his head on the cross, for Jesus is the Son, the Son of God, the light of the world, 
the risen Savior, who will come again, as it does every morning. The glory of God, who defends against the works of darkness, as he is born again every morning, and can be seen coming in the clouds, up in heaven, with his crown of thorns, or sun rays. Now, of the many astrological, astronomical metaphors in the Bible, one of the most important has to do with the ages. Throughout the scriptures, there are numerous references to the age. In order to understand this, we need to be familiar with a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. The ancient Egyptians, along with cultures long before them, recognized that approximately every 2150 years, the sunrise on the morning of the spring equinox would occur in a different sign of the zodiac. This has to do with a slow angular wobble that the earth maintains as it rotates on its axis. It is called a precession because the constellations go backwards rather than through the normal yearly cycle. The amount of time it takes for the precession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year, and ancient societies were very aware of this, and they referred to each 2150 year period as an age. From 4300 BC to 2150 BC, it was the age of Taurus, the bull. From 2150 BC to 1 AD, it was the age of Aries, the ram. And from 1 AD to 2150 AD, it is the age of Pisces, the age we are still in to this day. And in and around 2150, we will enter the new age, the age of Aquarius. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshiping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshiping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Ares the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Ares, and upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Ares, the age of Pisces, or the two fish. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we have all seen the Jesus fish on the back of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22.10, when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the last Passover would be, Jesus replies, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the Son, God's Son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, the main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28:20, 20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, 
world is a mistranslation among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true, as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Furthermore, the character of Jesus being a literary and astrological hybrid is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. For example, inscribed about 3500 years ago on the walls at the temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Miracle Conception, the Birth and the Adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth announcing to the Virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the Virgin, and then the Virgin Birth and the Adoration. This is exactly the story of Jesus' miracle conception. In fact, the literary similarities between the Egyptian religion and the Christian religion are staggering. and the plagiarism is continuous. The story of Noah and Noah's Ark is taken directly from tradition. The concept of the Great Flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims in different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a great flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove, all held in common with the biblical story, among many other similarities. And then there is the plagiarized story of Moses. Upon Moses' birth, it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide. He was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince. This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid infanticide and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. Furthermore, Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver in a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt, there was Mises, who carried stone tablets and upon them the laws of God were written. Manu, Minos, Mises, Moses. And as far as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. What the Book of the Dead phrased, I have not stolen, became thou shall not steal. I have not killed, became thou shall not kill. I have not told lies, became thou shall not bear false witness, and so forth. In fact, the Egyptian religion is likely the primary foundational basis for the Judeo-Christian theology. Baptism, afterlife, final judgment, virgin birth, death and resurrection, crucifixion, the Ark of the Covenant, circumcision, saviors, holy communion, great flood, Easter, Christmas, Passover, and many, many more are all attributes of Egyptian ideas long predating Christianity and Judaism. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders, wrote, when we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem sons of Jupiter. In a different writing, Justin Martyr said, he was born of a virgin, except this in common with what you believe of Perseus. It's obvious that Justin and other early Christians knew how similar Christianity was to the pagan religions. However, Justin had a solution. As far as he was concerned, 
the devil did it. The devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create his characteristics in the pagan world. Fundamentalist Christianity, fascinating. These people actually believe the world is 12,000 years old. I swear to God. I actually asked one of these guys, okay, dinosaur fossils. He says, dinosaur fossils? God put those here to test our faith. I think God put you here to test my faith, dude. The Bible is nothing more than an astrotheological literary hybrid, just like nearly all religious myths before it. In fact, the aspect of transference of one character's attributes to a new character can be found within the book itself. In the Old Testament, there is the story of Joseph. Joseph was a prototype for Jesus. Joseph was born of a miracle birth. Jesus was born of a miracle birth. Joseph was of 12 brothers. Jesus had 12 disciples. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Brother Judah suggests the sale of Joseph. Disciple Judas suggests the sale of Jesus. Joseph began his work at the age of 30. Jesus began his work at the age of 30. The parallels go on and on. Furthermore, is there any non-biblical historical evidence of any person living with the name Jesus, the son of Mary, who traveled about with 12 followers, healing people and the like? There are numerous historians who lived in and around the Mediterranean, either during or soon after the assumed life of Jesus. How many of these historians document this figure? Not one. However, to be fair, that doesn't mean defenders of the historical Jesus haven't claimed the contrary. Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, and Tacitus are the first three. Each one of their entries consists of only a few sentences at best, and only referred to Christus or the Christ, which in fact is not a name but a title. It means the Anointed One. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Sadly, it is still cited as truth. You would think that a guy who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for all eyes to see and perform the wealth of miracles acclaimed to him would have made it into the historical record. It didn't because once the evidence is weighed, there are very high odds that the figure known as Jesus did not even exist. We don't want to be unkind, but we want to be factual. We don't want to cause hurt feelings, but we want to be academically correct in what we understand and know to be true. Christianity just is not based on truth. We find that Christianity was in fact nothing more than a Roman story developed politically. The reality is, Jesus was the solar deity of the Gnostic Christian sect. And like all other pagan gods, he was a mythical figure. It was the political establishment that sought to historize the Jesus figure for social control. In 325 AD in Rome, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea. It was during this meeting that the politically motivated Christian doctrines were established and thus began a long history of religious bloodshed and spiritual fraud. And for over the next 1,000 years, the Vatican maintained a political stranglehold on all of Europe, leading to such joyous periods as the Dark Ages, along with enlightening events such as the Crusades and the Inquisition. Christianity, along with all other related theologies, is an historical fraud. These religions now serve to detach the species from the natural world, and likewise, each other. They support blind submission to authority. They reduce human responsibility to the effect that God controls everything, and in turn, awful crimes can be justified in the name of a divine pursuit. And, most critically, it empowers the political establishment who have been using the myth 
to manipulate and control societies. The religious myth is one of the most powerful devices ever created, and it serves as the psychological soil upon which other myths can flourish. A myth is an idea that, while widely believed, is false. In a deeper sense, in the religious sense, a myth serves as an orienting and mobilizing story for a people. The focus is not on the story's relation to reality, but on its function. A story cannot function unless it is believed to be true in the community or the nation. It is not a matter of debate. If some people have the bad taste to raise the question of the truth of the sacred story, the keepers of the faith do not enter into debate with them. They ignore them or denounce them as blasphemers. It is wrong, blasphemous, and sinful for you to suggest, imply, or help other people come to the conclusion that the U.S. government killed 3,000 of its own citizens. scenes of an old building being purposely dynamited and blown up. Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. The way the structure is collapsing, this was the result of something that was planned. It's not accidental that the first tower just happened to collapse and then the second tower just happened to collapse in exactly the same way. How they accomplished this, we don't know. The building collapsed to dust. You don't find a desk, you don't find a chair, you don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized from river to river. There was dust powder, two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. In addition to those pictures, we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. If, if it had detonated, that yes, was that they were planned yeah. to take down our building. I heard a second explosion. There was a uh, heavy-duty explosion. Then there was secondary explosions and then the subsequent collapses. The explosion blew and it knocked everybody over. To me it sounded like an explosion. It sounded like gunfire. Bang, 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 bang. And then all of a sudden, three big explosions. We heard a big explosion coming down. And then the entire top of the building just blew up. We saw some kind of explosion. By the force of the explosions. Big explosion. Blew it back into the eighth floor. Then we get to the lobby. This is a big explosion. The lobby looked as though a bomb had exploded there. A huge explosion now raining debris. It's been a huge explosion. Huge explosion that we all heard and felt. We just witnessed some kind of follow-up explosion. We heard a very loud blast explosion. That is another bomb going off. He thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. Planted in the building. I don't think anybody could have predicted that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked 
airplane as a missile. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings. No specific threat involving uh, really a domestic operation or involving uh, what happened, obviously, you know, the city's uh, airliner and so forth. There uh, were uh, no warning signs that I'm aware of. USA Today reports that in the two years before the attacks on September the 11th, NORAD conducted exercises using hijacked airliners as weapons. And one target was the World Trade Center. In confidential documents from the Philippines obtained by CNN, the plan was clear. He will board any American commercial aircraft, control its cockpit, and dive it at the CIA headquarters. Other buildings targeted the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. The Federal Aviation Administration received 52 warnings about Al-Qaeda in the six months before 9-11 and did not apparently heed them. The Pentagon reportedly does not want the public to hear next week's Senate testimony about the former secret intelligence unit known as Able Danger. And it identified Mohammed Atta and three other 9-11 terrorists as members of an Al-Qaeda cell in Brooklyn, New York, more than a year before the attacks. We found two of the three cells which conducted the 9-11 attacks. Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, who was the first member of Able Danger to go public, has now been told in writing by the Defense Intelligence Agency that he can't speak to members of Congress or their staff without prior approval. This is an attempt to prevent the American people from knowing the facts about how we could have prevented 9-11, and people are covering it up today. Security and counterterrorism was blinking red in the words of George Tennant, that the warnings of an imminent attack were so severe that something dramatic should have been done. It was unparalleled. Uh, instead, our president went on a month-long vacation. The head of Pakistani intelligence of the ISI, Mahmoud Ahmed, requested Omar Sheikh to wire a hundred thousand dollars to Mohammed Atta who was the lead hijacker. Did hijacker Mohammed Atta received wire transfers via Pakistan. The man sending the money to Atta is believed to be Ahmed Umar Saeed Sheikh. Omar Sheikh admitted he was supported by the Pakistan government's intelligence service, the ISI. As hard as this is to believe that two of the alleged terrorists involved in what happened on Tuesday may have attended schools run by the U.S. military. Evidence was also apparently planted. The passport of one of the hijackers on Flight 11 was allegedly found in the rubble. The hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. The 9-11 hijackers are alive and well. That's according to the chief of Japan's Democratic Party who says 9-11 is a hoax. Several of these 19 men are still alive. Of course we're after Saddam Hussein, I mean, uh, bin Laden, he's, he's, he's... In the early 1980s, bin Laden worked with operatives from U.S. intelligence, the Pakistani military, and Arab states. January 2001, the Bush administration orders the FBI and intelligence agencies to back off investigations involving the bin Laden family, including two of Osama bin Laden's relatives, who were living, guess where, in Falls Church, Virginia, right next to CIA headquarters. When he was already America's most wanted criminal, he reportedly spent two weeks in the American hospital in Dubai, was treated by an American doctor, and visited by the local CIA agent. We have not seen one piece of evidence 
that links Osama bin Laden directly to the planning stages of September 11th. This failure to provide proof was later said to be unnecessary because bin Laden, in a video allegedly found in Afghanistan, admitted responsibility for the attacks. In 1976, Osama's older brother Salim bin Laden hired a man in Texas by the name of Jim Bath to handle all the investments in the United States for the bin Laden family. Jim Bath also happens to be a personal, almost lifelong friend and former Air National Guard pilot with George W. Bush. The connections between the Bushes and the bin Ladens become much more clear when George Herbert Walker Bush made trips to Saudi Arabia in 1998 and 2000 to meet with the Bin Laden family on behalf of a company called the Carlyle Group. How could anyone fly a 60-ton, 125-foot-wide, 44-foot-tall plane through this obstacle course? The aircraft, before striking the Pentagon, reportedly executed a 270-degree downward spiral, and yet Hani Han Ewer was known as a terrible pilot who could not safely fly even a small plane. No seats, no luggage, no bodies. Nothing but bricks and limestone. The official explanation is that the intense heat from the jet fuel vaporized the entire plane. Flight 77 had two Rolls-Royce engines made of steel and titanium alloy and weighed six tons each. It is scientifically impossible that 12 tons of steel and titanium was vaporized by jet fuel. We're also told that the bodies were able to be identified either by their fingerprints or by the DNA. So what kind of fire can vaporize aluminum and tempered steel and yet leave, leave human bodies intact? From my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. And as I said, the only pieces left uh, that you can see are, are small enough that you could pick up in your hand. Shortly after the strike, government agents picked up debris and carried it off. The entire lawn was covered with dirt and gravel so that any remaining forensic evidence was literally covered up. The videos from security cameras, which would show what really hit the Pentagon, were immediately confiscated by agents of the FBI, and the Department of Justice has to this day refused to release them. If these videos would prove that the Pentagon was really hit by a 757, most of us would assume the government would release them. It looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground. Uh, basically, that's right. The only thing you could see from where we were uh, was a big gouge in the earth and some broken trees. We could see some people working, walking around in the area, but from where we could see, there wasn't much left. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. The FBI and the state police here have confirmed that they have cordoned off a second area about six to eight miles away from the crater here. This is apparently another debris site. Why would debris be located six miles away? Could it have blown that far away? Seems highly unlikely. Pancake theory. 
according to which the fires, while not melting the steel, heated it up sufficiently to cause the floors weakened by the airplane strikes to break loose from the steel columns. And this started a chain reaction. So you would expect then from that theory, which is the official theory, to see a whole stack of floors piled up on top of each other and then a spindle of core columns standing too. The core of each of the twin towers consisted of 47 massive steel columns. If the floors had broken loose from them, these columns would have still been sticking up into the air a thousand feet. The plane did not cut all those core columns. We designed the buildings to take the impact of the Boeing 707 uh, hitting the building at any location. The building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners. That the plane flew straight into the building. Straight through, through him, right. So you're saying that the building was actually designed to cope with a hole like that and right. then still yeah, survive? Yeah, it was, it was. If you had dropped, say, a billiard ball from the top of the World Trade Center, 110 floors up there, it would have taken 8 to 10 seconds to hit the ground, encountering no resistance whatsoever. The Twin Towers came down in nearly free fall speed. 200,000 tons of steel shatters and explodes outwards over 500 feet. This means that floors shattered at an average rate about 10 floors per second. There is no scenario for a pancake effect of buildings falling that allows them to fall at the rate of free fall. Now what can do that? What, what can move mass out of the way? Explosives. Forty-seven huge steel columns going up the core. And they're interconnected. How do you get uh, them to fail simultaneously so the core disappeared. It looks like those core columns were cut. The way we do this is by cutting the beam at an angle. I started looking at the molten metal. All three buildings, both towers in the rubble, in the basement areas, and Building 7, there's these pools of molten metal. Get down below and you'd see molten steel. Like little... Molten steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Like lava lava. Okay. The molten steel was found three, four, and five weeks later when the rubble was being removed. He said that molten steel was also found underneath World Trade Center 7. So I'm looking through the official reports. What do they say about the molten metal? They say nothing. But wait a minute. This is important evidence. So where did that come from? Thermite is so hot that it'll just cut through steel, through structural steel, for example, like a knife through butter. The products are molten iron and aluminum oxide, which goes off primarily as a dust. You know those enormous dust clouds? You can imagine when you assemble these chemicals on a large scale. So, Professor Niels Harrett, you examined the rubble that came from the World Trade Center. What did you find in it? Well, in there we find remains of what we characterize as a thermitic material. And this is a very energetic material which can be used either for melting iron or it can be designed as an explosive. The evidence for controlled demolition is overwhelming. I told you that the thermite reaction produced molten iron. Molten iron was in pools of molten iron under in the rubble. And, and the point is that the thermite kept on reacting. This was the bitches brew of thermite chemistry. Molten metal pools under both towers after they collapsed and Building 7. Now Building 7 wasn't even hit by a, a jet. Part of the problem is that most people simply don't know much about Building 7 due to the extraordinary secrecy surrounding this collapse. And this was a 47-story skyscraper. This building fell at 525. It was not hit by a plane. This building had fires on only two or three floors. And it was brought down by what we know was a controlled demolition. Demolitions, they look just like that. You know, a kink in the middle, and then that building just comes straight down almost at free fall speed.
Our office was on the B1 level. As I was talking to a supervisor at A46, and all of a sudden we hear, boom! An explosion so hard that pushed us upwards. And it came from the basement between the B2 level and the B3 level. And when I went to verbalize, we hear, boom! The impact of the plane on the top. It, it would appear, Jim, mm. as if there's more smoke coming from the ground. I was down in the basement, came down, all of a sudden the elevator blew up. And as we were coming out, we passed the lobby, there was no lobby. So I believe the, the bomb hit the lobby first, and a couple of seconds in the first plane hit. As I'm walking by the main freight car of the building in the corridor, that's, that's when I got blown. I mean, the impact of the explosion threw me to the floor, and that's when everything started happening. All of a sudden, a big impact happened again. And all the ceiling tile was falling down, the light fixtures were falling. You know, you gotta go clear across the hole from one to one to two World Trade Center. And then all of a sudden it happened all over again. Well, something else hit us to the floor. Right in the basement you felt it, walls were caving in, everything that was going on. I, I mean, I know people that got killed in the basement, I know people that got broken legs in their, in the basement, people that got reconstructive for surgery because the walls hit them in the face. According to standard operating procedure, if an FAA flight controller notices anything that suggests a possible hijacking, the controller is to contact a superior. If the problem cannot be fixed within about a minute, the superior is to ask NORAD, the North American Aerospace Command, to send up or scramble jet fighters to find out what is going on. NORAD then issues the scramble order to the nearest Air Force base with fighters on alert. But although interceptions usually occur within 10 or so minutes, in this case, 80 or so minutes, had elapsed before fighters were even airborne. It's a mind-bending anomaly. Not a single U.S. Air Force interceptor turns a wheel until it's too late. There are no jets at all. What if they were so confused and had been so deliberately confused that they couldn't respond? The reason that they didn't know where to go was because a number of conflicting and overlapping uh, war game exercises were taking place. It involved the insertion of false radar blips onto radar screens in the Northeast Air Defense Sector. Center Team U, we have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York. We need someone to scramble some F-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? Is this, is this real world or exercise? There was another exercise, Vigilant Warrior, which was in fact, according to a NORAD source, a live fly hijack drill being conducted at the same time. With only eight available fighter aircraft and they have to be dispatched in pairs, they were dealing with as many as 22 possible hijacks on the day of 9-11 and they couldn't separate the war game exercises from the actual hijacks. Page 172, the U.S. government has not been able to determine the origin of the money used for the 9-11 attacks. Ultimately, the question is of little practical significance. The American authorities have not managed to trace the source of the funding. And then the most amazingly disingenuous statement ultimately is it of little consequence. It is of massive consequence. Doesn't it matter who paid for 9-11? The collapse of Building 7 has been recognized as especially difficult to explain. The 9-11 Commission report implicitly admitted that it could not explain the collapse of this building by not even mentioning it. President, why are you and the Vice President insisting on appearing together before the 9-11 Commission? Because the 9-11 Commission, Commission wants to ask us questions. That's why we're meeting, and I look forward to meeting with them and answering their questions. Uh, why you're appearing together rather than separately, which was their request? because it's a good chance for both of us to answer questions that the 9-11 Commission is uh, looking forward to asking us, and I'm looking forward to answering them. Let's see. Do you think they should be able to stand up and, and, and speak their own words? They should go under oath. They should be, yeah, in public.
Don't you think that the families deserve to have a transcript or to be able to see what <laughs> Adam, you said? Adam, you asked me that question yesterday. For an I got the same that. answer, yeah. The final report was a unanimous report. That means that if there was a single commissioner who had any objection about anything, that fact would be dropped from the report. We have found out that he not only served on the transition team of the Bush administration, that he was a person who wrote a draft memo for the setup of the Bush administration's National Security Council, that he was an individual who wrote the preemptive war strategy that was eventually used for the war in Iraq, that he is a close friend of Condoleezza Rice's. We want him to resign. There is literally nothing in the 9-11 report that the Bush administration did not approve of. We can understand, therefore, why the commission, under Zelikow's leadership, would have ignored all the evidence that would point to the truth, that 9-11 was a false flag operation intended to authorize the doctrines and funds needed for a new level of imperial mobilization. Armed with knives, armed with chemical, biological, nuclear weapons. Fanatics, terrorists, September 11th. September 11th, killers, September 11th, terrorists. Terrorists of Al-Qaeda, terrorists, nuclear weapons, terrorists. 9-11, terror, terror, terrorists, evil. September 11th, September 11th, the terrorist war and danger. September 11th, terrorism, global terrorism, terrorism, terrorist. Terrorist, 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 the terror. Terrorist, terrorist, terrorism. September 11th, global terrorism, terrorist, terror, terrorism. September 11th, world terror. Terrorism, 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 September 11, global terrorism. September the 11th, terror, 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 weapons of mass destruction. September the 11th, September the 11th, terrorists, the evil terrorists, 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 no. Terrorism. The words are hypnotically repeated. Terrorism, terrorist, terrorist threat, and of course, believed to be linked to Al-Qaeda. But it's the so-called war on terrorism that's in our faces practically 24-7 as the inescapable focus of our existence. One day, our grandchildren will look back on this time and ask, how was the war on terror won? The entire U.S. ruling class, ruling elite, comes to see terrorism as the preferred means, indeed the only means, to provide social cohesion, to provide an enemy image for the society to keep it together. According to neocon theory from Carl Schmitt, you have to have an enemy image in order to have a society. It's a very dangerous thing because now it means that the entire social order, the political parties, intellectual life, politics in general, all based on a monstrous myth, monstrous myth. Look, the CIA has done in this country, what they've done to us is unbelievable. Look at the terrorist acts that have occurred. The CIA behind most, if not all of them. We had the Marine Barracks, we had our embassy in Kenya. We had Pan Am, 103. We had the USS Cole. Uh, we had Oklahoma City. We had the World Trade Center in 1993. That helped the terrorists blow up the World Trade Center the first time. They built the bomb. They, they got the driver's license. The informant, the FBI informant, fellow named Salam, a 43-year-old former Egyptian uh, army officer, he was given the assignment to put the bomb together. And he went to his supervisor, his FBI supervisor, and said, we're going to put a dummy bomb in here, right? He's, and the FBI supervisor said, no, we're going to put a real bomb. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. Unfortunately for them, there were only six people killed, not enough to pass the legislation. So what happened is, two years later, April 19, 1995, down comes Oklahoma City, uh, Murrah Building, 168 people killed. One year later, the anti-terrorism legislation that takes away any of our constitutional rights and civil liberties is passed.
because at half past nine this morning we were actually running an exercise for a, over a, a company of a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations that happened this morning. So I still have the hairs on the back of my neck standing upright. To get this quite straight, you were running uh, a, an exercise to see where, how you would cope with this and it happened while you were running the exercise? Precisely. supposed to believe is some kind of coincidence, there was also an anti-terrorist drill going on on 7-7. And again, just like 9-11, they were talking about attacks on the same targets, the same kind of tube stations, and exactly the same time as the actual attack happened, providing some kind of cover for what must be operations orchestrated in some way by the state. absolutely appalled at how much people in this country do not think we are given to understand that a, uh, that a guy out there in, up in the mountains financed the most elaborate attack on this country. Do you think some people in a cave, do you think some people in a cave were able to have NORAD stand down? Do you think that people in a cave were able to have all of this happen? And when I think about how many Americans were killed in New York City and believing as I do that this thing was a setup job, this is a textbook operation that Nazis used and they've used it over and over again. America has been suckered in one more time. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street. and There's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe, and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radials, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest, I don't want you to write, I don't want you to write to your congressmen because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being, God damn it! My life has value! commenced in Europe in 1939, it was realized that the American people had no intention of entering the war. But they believed that this country could be enticed into the war in very much the same way that it was enticed into the last one. They planned first to prepare the United States for foreign war under the guise of American defense. Second, 
to involve us in the war, step by step, without our realization. Third, to create a series of incidents which would force us into the actual conflict. These plans were, of course, to be covered and assisted by the full power of their propaganda. Our theaters soon became filled with plays portraying the glory of war. Newsreels lost all semblance of objectivity. And they have used the war to justify the restriction of congressional power and the assumption of dictatorial procedures on the part of the president and his appointees. A fear campaign was inaugurated. We cannot allow the natural passions and prejudices of other peoples to lead our country to destruction. The American Revolutionary War began as the American colonies sought to detach from England and its oppressive monarchy. Though many reasons are cited for the revolution, one in particular sticks out as a prime cause. That King George III of England outlawed the interest-free, independent currency the colonies were producing themselves. In turn forcing them to borrow money from the Central Bank of England, immediately creating economic hardship and despair. In the words of Peter Cooper, former vice president of the New York Board of Currency, after Franklin had explained to the British government as the real cause of prosperity, they immediately passed laws forbidding the payment of taxes in that money. This produced such great inconvenience and misery to the people that it was the principal cause of the revolution. In 1783, America won its independence from England. However, its battle against the central bank concept and the corrupt, power-hungry mentality associated with it had just begun. So what is a central bank? A central bank is an institution that issues and regulates the currency of an entire nation. Based on historical precedent, the typical powers inherent in central banking practice include the control of interest rates and the expansion and contraction of the money supply itself. Now, the central bank does not simply issue money to the government, it loans it to them with interest. Then, through the mechanisms of increasing and decreasing the supply of money, the central bank essentially regulates the value of the currency issued. It is critical to understand that the entire structure of this system can only produce one thing in the long run. Debt. It doesn't take a lot of ingenuity to figure this scam out. For nearly every single dollar produced by both the central bank and its regulated commercial banks is loaned at interest. That means every dollar produced is actually the dollar plus a certain percentage of debt based on that dollar. And since the banking system has the monopoly of the production of the currency, and they loan each dollar out with an immediate debt attached to it, where does the money to pay for the debt come from? It can only come from the banks again, which means the banking system has to perpetually increase its money supply to temporarily cover the outstanding debt created which, in turn, since that new money is loaned out at interest as well, creates even more debt. The end result of this system is essentially slavery, for it is technically impossible for a government, and thus the public, to ever come out of the self-generating debt.
By the early 20th century, the US had already implemented and removed a few central banking systems, which were maneuvered into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking and business world were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds. And in the early 1900s, they sought to push, once again, legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and public were very weary of such an institution. So they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. So, J.P. Morgan, publicly considered a financial luminary at the time, exploited his mass influence by reportedly creating rumors that prominent banks in New York were insolvent or bankrupt. Morgan knew this would trigger mass hysteria and a systemic crisis. And it did. The public, in fear of losing their deposits, immediately began mass withdrawals. Consequently, the banks were forced to call in their loans, causing the recipients to sell their property, and thus a spiral of bankruptcies, repossessions, and turmoil emerged. Putting the pieces together years later, Congressman Charles Lindbergh wrote, The King Bankers put in motion in 1907 a great scheme. They had gambled and speculated on Wall Street until so many watered stocks and bonds had been manufactured. The King Bankers knew the condition and informed the favored of their friends what was to come. There was to be a panic in the fall of 1907 that would be advertised as the result of our bad banking and currency laws. The panic of 1907 led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich, who had intimate ties to the financial powers and later became part of the Rockefeller family through marriage. The commission led by Aldrich recommended a central bank should be implemented so a panic like 1907 could never happen again. This was the spark that the bankers needed to initiate their plan. And in 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that most of the figures who attended disguised their names when en route to the island. After this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And a few days before Christmas, when much of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. The night before its passage, Congressman Charles Lindbergh pleaded, This act establishes the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs this act, the invisible government by the money power will be legalized. Now, the public was told that the Federal Reserve System was an economic stabilizer, and inflation and economic crises were a thing of the past. Well, as history has shown, nothing was further from the truth. The fact is, the bankers now had a streamlined machine for economic manipulation. For example, from 1914 to 1919, the Fed substantially increased the money supply, resulting in extensive loans to small banks and the public. Then, in 1920, the Fed deliberately contracted credit in an extreme way, thus resulting in banks having to call in large numbers of loans, and, just like 1907, bank runs, bankruptcy, and systemic collapse occurred. Numerous competitive banks outside of the Federal Reserve System collapsed, further consolidating the monopoly of the money trust cartel. Privy to this scheme, Congressman Charles Lindbergh pronounced, Under the Federal Reserve Act, panics are scientifically created. The present panic is the first scientifically created one, worked out as we figure a mathematical equation. However, the panic of 1920 was just a warm-up. From 1921 to 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply, resulting, once again, in extensive loans to the public and banks. There was also a fairly new type of loan in the stock market, the broker call loan. Very simply, this loan allowed an investor to put down only a fraction of the stock's value, with the rest being loaned from the broker. This method was very popular in the roaring 1920s, as everyone seemed to be making money in the market. However, there was a catch to this loan. It could be called in at any time and had to be paid within 24 hours. And the typical result was the selling of the stock purchased with that loan. 
So, a few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller, Bernard Baruch, and other insiders quietly exited the market, knowing the bubble created was about to burst. And on October 24, 1929, the financiers who furnished the call loans started calling them in, in mass. This sparked an instantaneous massive sell-off in the already inflated market, as sell orders and margin calls were systemically triggered. That then led to mass bank runs, eventually collapsing thousands of banks, enabling the large banks to buy up the now failed ones at a discount. But it didn't stop there. Rather than expanding the money supply in order to recover from this economic collapse, the Fed actually contracted it, fueling one of the largest depressions in American history. Outraged, Congressman Lewis McFadden, then chairman of the House Banking Committee, filed petition for impeachment against the Federal Reserve Board, stating, Mr. Chairman, we have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks. This evil institution has impoverished and ruined the people of the United States and has practically bankrupted our government. It has done this through the defects of the law under which it operates, through the maladministration of that law by the Federal Reserve Board and through the corrupt practices of the moneyed vultures who control it. Now, having reduced the society to squalor, it was then decided that the gold standard should be removed. In order to do this, they needed to acquire the remaining gold in the system. So, under the pretense of helping to end the depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in America was required to turn in all gold bullion to the treasury, essentially robbing the public of what little real wealth they had left. And at the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished. If you look at a dollar bill before 1933, it says it is redeemable in gold. You look at the dollar bill today, it says it is legal tender, which means it is backed by absolutely nothing. The only thing that gives our money value is the public faith and how much of it is in circulation. Therefore, the power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power to manipulate and control entire economies. It is important to clearly understand, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. It is about as federal as Federal Express. It makes its own policies and is under little regulation by the U.S. government. It is a private bank that loans all the currency at interest to the government, completely consistent with the central banking model that the country sought to escape from when it declared independence in the American Revolutionary War. Now, going back to 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was not the only bill pushed through Congress for the vested financial interests. They also pushed its partner, the Federal Income Tax. First of all, the Federal Income Tax is completely unconstitutional, as it is a direct, unapportioned tax, and the required number of states needed in order to ratify the amendment to allow the income tax was never legally met, and this has even been cited in modern court cases. Second, at the present day, roughly 25% of the average worker's income is taken from them via this tax. That means you work three months out of the year to fulfill this tax obligation. And where does that money go? Well, according to the Grace Commission report of the 1980s, 100% of what is collected is absorbed solely by interest on the federal debt and by federal government contributions to transfer payments. In other words, all individual income tax revenues are gone before one nickel is spent on the services which taxpayers expect from their government. Today, the money Americans make working three months out of the year goes almost entirely to the interest fees charged for the debt-based fiat currency. The fact is, the federal income tax exists to feed the Federal Reserve Federal Government money machine, making sure the interest payments are always there. And third, even with the government claim as to the legality of the income tax, there is evidently no clear statute, no law in existence that requires you to pay this tax. I really expected that, of course, there's a law that you can point to in the law book, the code, that requires you to file a tax return. Of course there is. I was at that point where I couldn't find the statute that clearly made a person liable. 
uh, at least not me and uh, most people I know. And I had no, no choice in my mind except to, to resign. Based on the research that I did throughout the year 2000 and that I'm still doing, I have not found that law. I've asked uh, Congress, we've asked a lot of people in the IRS, IRS commissioners, helpers. They can't answer because if they answer, the American people are going to know that this whole thing is a fraud. I haven't uh, filed an income, federal income tax return since I left. I have not filed a tax return since 1999. Now, the control of the economy and the manipulation of society for the vested financial powers is only a part of the game being played. Another level is the business of war. Since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, a number of large and small wars have commenced. The three most pronounced might be World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. World War I. In 1914, European wars broke out centered around England and Germany. The American public wanted nothing to do with the war. In turn, President Woodrow Wilson publicly declared neutrality. However, under the surface, evidence now shows that the financial powers behind the administration were looking for any excuse it could to enter it. It is important to understand that one of the most lucrative things that can happen for the bankers is war, for it forces the country to borrow even more money at interest, not to mention the profits generated through the financing of military productions. In the words of two-time Congressional Medal of Honor winner Smedley D. Butler, war is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, and surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope, and it is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. Woodrow Wilson's top advisor and mentor was Colonel Edward House, a man found to have intimate connections with the financial interests of the time. In a conversation between Colonel House, Wilson's advisor, and Sir Edward Gray, the Foreign Secretary of England regarding America and the war, Gray inquired, What will America do if Germans sink an ocean liner with American passengers on board? House responded, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into war. So, on May 7, 1915, a ship called the Lusitania was sent where German military vessels were known to be. And, as likely expected, German U-boats torpedoed the ship, exploding stored munitions, killing 1,200 people. To further understand the obvious anticipation of this setup, the German embassy actually put advertisements in the New York Times telling people that if they boarded the Lusitania, they did so at their own risk, as such a ship sailing from America to England through the war zone would be liable to destruction. In turn, and as anticipated, the sinking of the Lusitania created a wave of anger among the American population, and America entered the war a short time after. Major General Smedley D. Butler summarizes the monetary reality of World War I. World War II. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, triggering U.S. entry into that war. President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared the attack was a day that will live in infamy. A day of infamy indeed, but not because of the alleged surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. After 60 years of surfacing information, it is clear that not only was the attack known well in advance, it was outright wanted and provoked. In a journal entry by Roosevelt's Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, dated November 25, 1941, he documented a conversation he had with Roosevelt. The question was how we should maneuver them into firing the first shot. And in congressional testimony later, he added, it was desirable to make sure the Japanese be the ones to do this, so that there should remain no doubt as to who were the aggressors. 
In the months leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt had done almost everything in his power to anger the Japanese, showing a posture of aggression. He halted all of Japan's imports of American petroleum. He froze all the Japanese assets in the United States. He made public loans to nationalist China and supplied military aid to the British, both enemies of Japan in the war which, by the way, was in complete violation of international war rules. And with numerous Japanese codes broken in advance, revealing the plan to attack, on December 7, 1941, Japan was allowed to attack Pearl Harbor, killing 2,400 soldiers. Before Pearl Harbor, 83% of the American public wanted nothing to do with the war. After Pearl Harbor, one million men volunteered for that war. It is important to note, Nazi Germany's war effort was largely supported by two organizations, one of which was called IG Farben. IG Farben produced 84% of Germany's explosives. One of the unspoken partners of IG Farben was J.D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company in America. In fact, the German Air Force could not operate without a special additive patented by Rockefeller's Standard Oil. The drastic bombing of London by Nazi Germany, for example, was made possible by a $20 million sale of fuel to IG Farben by the Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company. This is just one small point on the topic of how American businesses funded both sides of World War II. One other treasonous organization worth mentioning is the Union Banking Corporation of New York City. Not only did they finance numerous aspects of Hitler's rise to power, along with actual materials during the war, it was also a Nazi money laundering bank, which was eventually exposed for having millions of dollars of Nazi money in its vaults. The Union Banking Corporation of New York was eventually seized for violations of the Trading with the Enemy Act. Guess who the director and vice president of the Union Bank was? Prescott Bush, the father and grandfather of former U.S. Presidents George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush. Vietnam. The United States official escalation and entry into the Vietnam War came after an alleged incident involving two U.S. destroyers being attacked by North Vietnamese PT boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. This was known as the Gulf of Tonkin Incident. This situation was the catalytic pretext for massive troop deployment and full-fledged warfare. One problem, however, the attack on the U.S. destroyers by Vietnamese PT boats never happened. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara stated years later that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a mistake, while declassified documents released years later show that it was a farce, manipulated for the purposes of war. And once in the war, it was business as usual. In October 1966, President Lyndon Johnson lifted trade restrictions on the Soviet bloc, knowing full well that the Soviets were providing upwards of 80% of North Vietnam's war supplies. Consequently, the Rockefeller interests financed factories in the Soviet Union, which the Soviets used to manufacture military equipment and send it to North Vietnam. However, the funding of both sides in this conflict was only one side of the coin. In 1985, Vietnam's rules of engagement were declassified. This detailed what American troops were and were not allowed to do in the war. It included such absurdities as North Vietnamese anti-aircraft missile systems could not be bombed until they were known to be fully operational. No enemy could be pursued once they crossed the border of Laos or Cambodia. And most revealing of all, the most critical strategic targets were not allowed to be attacked unless initiated by high military officials. Apart from these illogical limitations, North Vietnam was informed of these restrictions and therefore could base entire strategies around the limitations of the American forces. This is why the war went on for so long. And the bottom line is this. The Vietnam War was never meant to be won, just sustained. This war for profit and resources resulted in 58,000 American deaths and 3 million dead Vietnamese. So. Where are we now? September 11th was the jumpstart for a hegemonic agenda, enabling the possibility of constant global warfare. It was a staged war pretext no different than the sinking of the Lusitania, the provoking of Pearl Harbor, and the Gulf of Tonkin lie. In fact, if 9-11 wasn't a planned war pretext, it would be an exception to the rule. It has been used to launch two unprovoked illegal wars, one against Iraq and one against Afghanistan. However, 9-11 was a pretext for another war as well, the war against you. The Patriot Act, Homeland Security, the Military Tribunals Act, and other legislations are all completely designed to destroy your civil liberties 
and protect those in power. Currently in the United States, unannounced to most Americans, your home can be searched without a warrant, without you being home, you can in turn be detained indefinitely, with no charges revealed to you, no access to a lawyer, and legally tortured, all under the suspicion that you might be a terrorist. If you need a painted picture of what is happening, let's recognize how history repeats itself. In February 1933, Hitler staged the false flag attack, burning down his own German parliament building, the Reichstag, blaming it on communist terrorists. Within the next few weeks, he passed the Enabling Act, which completely eradicated the German constitution, destroying people's liberties. He then led a series of preemptive wars, all justified as necessary to maintaining homeland security. It's time to wake up. The people in power go out of their way to make sure you are perpetually misled and manipulated. The majority's perception of reality, especially in the political arena, is not their own. It is shrewdly imposed upon them without them even knowing it. For example, the public at large now believes the invasions of Iraq and the Middle East, along with the resulting instability, are the consequences of political and military mistakes. What the public fails to see, of course, is that the destabilization of the Middle East is exactly what the Western interests want. This war is to be sustained so the region can be divided up, domination of the oil maintained, continual profits reaped for defense contractors, and most obviously, permanent military bases established to be used as launching pads against other oil-bearing, non-conforming countries such as Iran. For further implication that the Middle East destabilization is purely intentional, in 2005, two elite British SAS officers were arrested by Iraqi police after being caught driving around in their car shooting at civilians while dressed up as Arabs. After being arrested and taken to a jail in Basra, the British army immediately demanded the release of these men. When the Basra government refused, British tanks came in and physically broke out the men from the Basra prison. If you wish to destroy an area, how do you do it? Well, there are two ways. You can go in there and bomb it and so forth, but that is not very efficient. What you do is you try to get the people in that area to kill each other and to destroy their own territory, their own farms. And that's what's been done in that area. The way in which you destroy an opponent is get him to destroy himself by dividing his ranks against one another. Then you feed both sides. You have agents feeding both sides, inflaming both sides, and they kill each other off. And it's time that some of us woke up to this reality to understand that people who try to maintain empires and create empires do it by manipulating the people they're trying to conquer. You might want to ask yourself why the entire culture is utterly saturated with mass media entertainment from all sides, while the educational system in America continues its stupefying downward slide since the U.S. government decided to take over and subsidize the public school system. What your government pays for, it gets. When we understand that, then we look at government-financed institutions of education and see the kind of students and the kind of education that's being turned out by these government finance schools, logic will tell you that if what is being turned out in those schools was not in accord with what the state and the federal government wanted, then it would change it. The bottom line is that the government is getting what they have ordered. They do not want your children to be educated. They do not want you to think too much. 
That is why our country and our world has become so proliferated with entertainments, mass media, television shows, amusement parks, drugs, alcohol, and every kind of entertainment to keep the human mind entertained so that you don't get in the way of important people by doing too much thinking. You had better wake up and understand that there are people who are guiding your life and you don't even know it. We're in a lot of trouble because you people and 62 million other Americans are listening to me right now because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it all falls into the hands of the wrong people. And when the largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world, who knows what shit will be peddled for truth on this network. So you listen to me. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You eat like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. The last thing the power establishment wants is a conscious, informed public capable of critical thinking. This is why a continually fraudulent zeitgeist is output via religion, the mass media, and the educational system. It is in their interest to keep you in a distracted, naive bubble, and they are doing a damn good job of it. This is Aaron Russo, a filmmaker and former politician. To his left is Nicholas Rockefeller of the Council on Foreign Relations. After maintaining a close friendship with Nicholas Rockefeller, Aaron eventually ended the relationship, appalled by what he had learned. Uh, I got a call one day from um, an attorney woman I knew, and she said, would you like to meet one of the Rockefellers? I said, sure, I'd love to. And uh, we became friends, and um, he began to divulge a lot of things to me. So he said to me one night, he said that uh, there's going to be an event there, and and out of that event, you're going to see we're going to go into Afghanistan. So we run pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We're going to go into Iraq to take the oil and establish a base in the Middle East. And we're going to go into Venezuela and, and try and get, and get rid of Chavez. And uh, the first two they've accomplished, Chavez they didn't accomplish. And uh, they said you're going to see guys going into caves looking for, <laughs> looking for people uh, that they're never going to find. You know, he was laughing about the fact that you have this war on terror, there's no real enemy. He's talking about how by having this war on terror, you can never win it because this is, so it's an eternal war. And so you can always keep taking people's liberties away. And I said, how are you going to convince people that this war is real? He said, but the media. The media can convince everybody it's real. I mean, you know, it's just that you keep talking about things. You keep saying it over and over and over again. And eventually people believe it. You know, you created the Federal Reserve in 1913 through lies. You create 9-11, which is another lie. Through 9-11, you, then you're fighting a war on terror. And now all of a sudden you go into Iraq, which was another lie. And now they're going to do Iran. You know, and it's all sort of one thing leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. Now I would say, to them, why, what are you doing this for? What, what, what's the point of this thing? You have all the money in the world you ever want. You have all the power. I said, you know, you're hurting people. It's, it's not a good thing. And he would say, what do you care about the people for? Take care of yourself and you take care of your family. And then I said to him, what's the ultimate, what are the ultimate goals here? 
to the ultimate the goal. The ultimate goal is to get everybody in this world chipped with the chip, with the RFID chip, and uh, have all money be on those chips and everything on those chips. And if anybody wants to protest what we do or violate what we want, we just turn off the chip. How far will the sickness of power go? To what lengths will those in control go in order to maintain and preserve their positions? We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. George Orwell, in his famed and possibly prophetic work, 1984, stated, Power is not a means, it is an end. The object of persecution is persecution. The object of torture is torture. The object of power is power. Today, symptoms of a surveillance society continue to grow as irrational fears of invisible enemies, coupled with rising economic instability, spread across the globe. It is under this guise of security that we can foreshadow a world where everyone is tracked, everyone is on camera, and everyone is subordinated. The most incredible aspect of all. Such totalitarianism would likely not be forced upon the people. Rather, the people will demand it. For the social manipulation of society through the generation of fear and division has completely inhibited the culture. Religion, patriotism, race, wealth, class, and every other form of arbitrary, separatist identification and thus conceit has served to create a controlled population, utterly malleable in the hands of the few. Divide and conquer is the motto, and as long as people continue to see themselves as separate from everything else, they lend themselves to being completely enslaved. However, if the people ever realize the truth of their relationship to nature, and the truth of their personal power to effect change, the entire manufactured zeitgeist that's preyed upon would collapse like a house of cards. The whole system that we live in drills into us that we're powerless, that we're weak, that our society is evil, that it's crime-ridden, etc. and so forth. It's all a big, fat lie. We are powerful, beautiful, extraordinary. There is no reason why we cannot understand who we truly are, where we are going. There is no reason why the average individual cannot be fully empowered. We are incredibly powerful beings. You know, I think I spent 30 years of my life in the first 30, trying to become something. I wanted to become good at things. I wanted to become good at tennis. I wanted to become good at school and grades and, and everything I kind of viewed in that perspective. I'm not okay the way I am, but if I got good at things, I realized that I had the game wrong. The game was to find out what I already was. Find out what I already was. for individual differences to stand out. So you look at each person, and immediately it is brighter, dumber, older, younger, richer, poorer, and we make all these dimensional dis distinctions, put them in categories and treat them that way. And we get so that we only see others as separate from ourselves in the ways in which they're separate. And one of the dramatic characteristics of experience is being with another person and suddenly seeing the ways in which they are like you, not different from you and experiencing the fact that, that which is essence in you and which is essence in me is indeed one. The understanding that there is no other. It is all one. And I wasn't born Richard Albert, I was just born as a human being. And then I learned this whole business of who I am and whether I'm good or bad or achieving or not, all that's learned along the way.
racial, sexual, and religious chauvinism to rabid nationalist fervor are beginning not to work. A new consciousness is developing which sees the earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. shows with this. Life's like a ride in an amusement park. And when you go on it, you think it's real, because that's how powerful our minds are. And the ride goes up and down and round and round. It has thrills and chills, and it's very brightly colored. And it's very loud, and it's fun for a while. Some have been on the ride for a long time, and they begin to question, is this real, or is this just a ride? And other people have remembered, and they come back to us, and they say, Hey, don't worry, don't be afraid ever, because this is just a ride. And we kill those people. Shut him up, I've got a lot invested in this ride. Shut him up! Look at my furrows of worry. Look at my big bank account and my family. This has to be real. It's just a ride. But we'll, we'll kill, kill those good guys who try and tell us that. You ever notice that? And let the demons run amok? But it doesn't matter, because it's just a ride, and we can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no, no savings of money. Just a choice right now between fear and love. <laughs>